listen. What do you hear? The song of 12,000 horsepower in action. Thousands of precision parts operating in flashing unison, obedient to the control of the skilled pilot and crew. Yet it takes a nightmarish panel of sensitive and complicated instruments and controls to adjust the power output for changing loads, speeds, and conditions in flight. Listen again. What do you hear? The familiar sound of a fine motor car engine. More than a hundred horsepower, responsive to the driver's lightest touch on the accelerator. Yet this fine engine must be constantly controlled all the time it's in operation to keep its power in balance with changing requirements. Again, what do you hear? The purr of an electric generator. As electrical power loads vary, as conditions vary, throughout the minutes, hours, days, weeks, and months, so must the power be regulated by watchful operators to keep the generator turning at constant speed. What do you hear? You guessed it. The beating of a human heart. One of the most amazing machines on Earth. The normal human pulse is between 70 and 80 beats per minute. Yet this rhythm varies every time we move or change position. Like this when we are resting. Like this when we are running or at play. And changing too with our emotions when we are happy, angry, or frightened. Listen. What do you hear now? That's right, the ticking of a watch. An accurate watch ticks five times each second. Like the engines of airplane and motor car, like the generator, like the human heart, your watch is a power plant that must operate unfailingly under an infinite variety of conditions. Yet, unlike our heartbeat, the beat of this tiny power plant must never vary. Unlike the giant generator, it has no tons of concrete on which to rest solid, level, and safe from vibrations which might affect its accuracy. There are no watchful attendants, no careful drivers, no skilled pilots, no banks of instruments and controls to regulate its speed and guard its accuracy. What controls the ticking of a watch? Inside, we find a beautifully poised and balanced mechanism of springs and gears, pinions and bearings. And this entire mechanism must be confined to a very small space. Still, it must run at a constant speed. Never more, never less, with an accuracy that approaches perfection. To understand what goes on inside a watch, let's make a simple device that will keep time. We'll use a garden hose. First, we'll place a little water wheel and dial in the center. When water passes through, it will turn the wheel and make the hand on the dial move. Now we'll attach the hose to a faucet. The faucet is our source of power. The hose conducts the water, our power in this case, past the dial to the nozzle. The nozzle controls the flow of power. By turning the nozzle, we can allow just a little water to flow through the hose, and the hand on the dial will turn slowly. By opening the nozzle wider, we allow a heavy stream of water to flow through the hose, and the hand on the dial turns faster if our source of power, the water pressure, remained constant, and if we could adjust the nozzle carefully enough, we would have a timepiece that would keep accurate time. Here, in a greatly simplified form, we have the four elements needed in every timepiece. A source of energy or power, a means of transmitting power, a dial to record the flow of power, and a way to control the power. 
Now let's see what these four elements are like in our watch. First, we'll take our watch apart, like this. We'll begin with this part, the mainspring and barrel assembly. And so we can see everything that goes on inside, let's use giant parts to make a watch model. This is the mainspring, and it lives inside the mainspring barrel. The mainspring is the power plant of the watch, the source of power, like the faucet in our water clock. By winding the spring, we can store up energy. Here is a winding stem with gears and a click to keep the spring from unwinding. And here is the unit that controls the flow of power, like the nozzle on our hose. It is called the balance wheel and hairspring assembly. It consists of the balance wheel, hairspring, balance staff or axle. Fastened to the balance staff is a part called a roller. To the roller is attached an upright jewel pin. Let's see how these work together. A push on the jewel pin will start the balance wheel moving and more pushes will keep it moving. To do this job of pushing, we need this odd anchor-shaped lever called a pallet. It can be mounted so that when we move the pallet back and forth, we can apply a series of impulses to the jewel pin to keep the balance wheel in motion. Now to the pallet cross arm, we add a pallet jewel shaped like this. Here is a wheel called an escape wheel with teeth on it so shaped that they will push the pallet jewel and jog the balance wheel into motion. Now we'll use the energy stored up in our mainspring to drive the escape wheel. As the mainspring uncoils, it causes the barrel to rotate with it. That didn't last long, did it? Let's try it again. Once things get started, there's nothing to stop them. What we need now is a way of holding the power in check, releasing it a little at a time just when it's needed. Another pallet jewel at the other end of the pallet cross arm will do the trick. Just as the first pallet jewel gets a push from the escape wheel, the second pallet jewel locks against another tooth of the escape wheel to hold the power of the mainspring in check. But the balance wheel keeps swinging and the jewel pin moves the fork end of the pallet until the escape wheel is again unlocked. But when we connect the mainspring directly to the escape wheel, the power is soon exhausted. In an actual watch, it would last only a few seconds. What we need is a way to stretch the power so it will last for more than a day. In our water clock, we used a hose to transmit power from the faucet to the nozzle. We also need a way to transmit power here. So let's add a system of gears and wheels. We'll stretch them out in a line instead of in their usual closely confined location in a watch. Look at the gears a moment and see what they do. First, a small partial turning of the main spring barrel drives the center wheel a complete revolution. partial revolution of the center wheel drives the third wheel a complete revolution.
and this in turn drives the fourth wheel much further. As a result, a few turns of the mainspring barrel, driven by the mainspring, will drive the escape wheel many, many revolutions, enough to last a full day and longer. What we have now is a complete model watch train. Through the gears, the mainspring drives the escape wheel. The escape wheel teeth push first on one pallet jewel and then the other. The pallet fork nudges the jewel pin on the balance wheel to keep it moving. The swinging balance wheel on its return trip moves the pallet fork. This unlocks the escape wheel to release a little more energy from the mainspring. Back and forth, the balance wheel swings, controlled by its small coiled spring, the hair spring, in perfect rhythm. Each swing unlocks the escape wheel so it can give an extra push to a pallet jewel, and this is passed on to the balance wheel assembly to keep the watch ticking far more steadily than any beating heart. All we have to do now to measure time is count the ticks. But this would be a tedious job and not very practical. Just as we needed a dial on our water clock, here too we need a method for recording the flow of power. So to the shaft of this gear or wheel, we add an indicating hand to measure seconds. As the gear train of a watch moves far enough to make five ticks of the escapement, the second hand moves one graduation on its dial. To count the minutes, we can attach a dial and fasten a pointer to this gear wheel, which is just the right size so that it turns one complete revolution while the second hand makes 60 revolutions. And to count the hours, we can have another pointer geared just so to move one complete revolution every 12 hours. The second hand makes a complete revolution and the minute hand moves one graduation and when the minute hand makes a complete revolution an hour has passed. Now we can tell what time it is. But a gear train all strung out like this is a long way from an actual watch. Let's let our model do a bit of rearranging all by itself. we know what time it is and how and why we know. A fine watch itself is, of course, a compact precision mechanism with parts miraculously small and fashioned by craftsmen with incredible accuracy. But the basic principles are those we have just seen, frequently applied on a scale almost microscopic to produce the world's most accurate portable measuring instrument. In a truly fine watch, there are many things which make possible the accurate control and release of power. Jewels, for example. Many people correctly believe jewels increase the value of a watch. They increase the value all right, but not by being ornamental. 
jewels are in a watch strictly for business. They add to the value only when correctly placed and used. They are the bearings which lessen friction, increase the regularity of the running, and greatly extend a watch's life of dependable service. Harder than the finest steel, these tiny surfaces are finished so smoothly they reflect images like a camera lens. And working with oil, it takes a drop no larger than a pinhead for the entire watch. There is almost no friction. If any single part of a watch can be called more important, it's the hairspring. It absorbs and gives out an equal amount of force with each beat or swing at regular intervals. In a fine watch, the hairspring has uniform thickness throughout its whole length, is polished to a mirror-like finish, and made of metal relatively unaffected by magnetism or changes in temperature. It can be apparently distorted, but it always returns to perfect shape. Hair springs are overcoiled, like we see here, to allow the spring to breathe evenly. Were this not done, the spring would coil and uncoil unevenly, fluff out on one side and interfere with the accuracy of the watch. Because a watch is required to run in any position, to be accurate, the balance wheel must be perfectly balanced in any position. This is done by poising. The wheel is poised when there is no effect of the pull of gravity reflected in its action on the knife-like edges of the instrument which checks it. With perfect poising, and with the hairspring centered on the balance wheel, it runs accurately in any position all the time. And it's the same with all the parts. The tiny screws, scarcely larger than a speck of dust. The exceedingly small shafts. The precisely made gears and pinions. The sturdy nickel silver plates and bridges. Every part is made with utmost precision precision which approaches perfection. When we look at the almost invisible parts, understand what they are required to do, realize the uncanny skill needed to make a fine watch, we can easily understand why it is a masterpiece of precision and accuracy. Here is a truly wonderful mechanism. With it, you can accurately measure the passing of time and record that passing for your use and convenience. But this mighty little servant is a creation of beauty too. A precious possession to be worn with pride and confidence every day, every week, every month, year after year. Listen, what do you hear? It's the ticking of a fine watch. Wherever you go, whatever you do, America's fine watch ticks steadily, accurately on. Five ticks every second. watch survive the Niagara Falls test? Attached to this heavily weighted ball, can this watch take the full impact of the rocks and rapids? It's going over, watch it, down into that raging torrent, buffeted and jolted by the force of that terrific current. And here it is, still ticking away, the world's greatest watch value. I'm Lyle Van, I'm a newscaster, and I covered this Niagara Falls story. This is the watch, the 17 jewel bull of a clipper handsome, rugged, in the charm and color of natural gold. Winds automatically with just the slightest motion of your wrist. It's anti-magnetic and features this handsome expansion band. Now the Bull of a Clipper is yours to try for two entire weeks before you pay one cent. Yours on the easiest of terms. Complete price from only $49.50.
You're watching Sleepcore. Pleasant dreams. The need to read which stirs the very souls of men is more evident in the present era of progress than ever before. Publishers, bookstores, and newsstands pour out thousands of books, magazines, and newspapers every day to inform, instruct, and amuse. The greater part of these printed materials are made possible by various types of mechanical typesetting. Machines which set type up in lines, cast from molten metal, first introduced at the close of the last century, are now the most widely used. Automatic typesetting of complete lines. These are the intertype and linotype machines, which are essentially the same, except only in the vast assortment of models designed to perform the particular needs of various types of special jobs. These composing machines produce typecast in complete lines or slugs. Here is a slug or line of type turned out by these machines. The lines of type, properly arranged, make up the page from which, after inking, the imprint or proof is made. The function of the keyboard composing machine is to produce the essential materials required to prepare a form for printing. But before going into detail, let's first get a general view of the whole picture. The operator, depressing the keys, releases mattresses from the magazine channels. The mattresses are delivered to the assembling elevator in the correct sequence. Here's a close-up of some mats. You can see the letter that has been punched or engraved into which the molten type metal is going to be injected. Let's note particularly the two punched characters, one Roman in style and the other italic. The small lugs and the ears which guide the mats through the various passages and assure the alignment of the letters. Having completed the composition of the line of mattresses, the operator sends it over to the casting mechanism. Now the line of mattresses is in position for the slug to be cast. Against the opening of this mold, the mats will fit perfectly. Immersed in the crucible, the plunger injects the molten type metal into the mold and against the matrix characters. The metal solidifies, forming letters and symbols in relief. Then the slugs are carried into position to be ejected from the mold and stacked one after another as they are ejected. Meanwhile, the first elevator rises and the second elevator descends to meet it at the transfer channel. The mattresses are transferred to the second elevator and raised to the distributor. Here, lifted automatically, one at a time, they are returned to their respective channels in the magazine. These circulating mattresses will be used over and over as they are needed for composition. Using this simple sketch of the machine, let's go over the various steps already seen. The mats, responding to the keyboard, are delivered to the assembling elevator. The line of mattresses is sent to the casting unit. After the slug has been cast, 
the mattresses are carried by the elevators and transferred for distribution. The operations necessary to produce a slug or line of type are divided into three groups. Composition of the matrix line, casting of the slug, distribution of the mattresses. Let's now analyze the operations in the first group. Composition. Regarding composition, the principal parts are the keyboard, the magazine, the assembler entrance, partition, the matrix delivery belt, the assembling elevator, and the delivery slide. The keyboard has 90 keys on six rows of 15 each. It is divided into three sections. The lowercase letters are at the left, uppercase in similar arrangement at the right. At the center, punctuation marks, numbers, and small caps. Every touch of the key releases the required matrix from the magazine. Now we will examine the internal parts of the keyboard activated by one touch of a key to release a matrix from the magazine. They are the key button, the keyboard lever, the key bar, the trigger, the cam frame, the eccentric cam, the rubber roller, the comb, and the key rod. Let's observe how the various pieces react to the key. The key moves the lever to which it is joined. This lifts the key bar. In turn, the key bar activates the trigger whose function it is to support the frame with its corresponding eccentric cam. The motion of the trigger allows the frame to lower itself so that the cam revolves around the rubber roller, which rotates continuously. The rotation of the cam lifts the end of the frame. This raises the long key rod, which causes the release of the matrix from the magazine. Similarly, we find on every machine corresponding to the keys, 90 key rods, which make up the assembled key rod frame, which is situated behind the assembler entrance and brings the keyboard into play with the magazine. Here are the upper ends of the key rods, which rock escapements situated in the magazine, thus allowing the mat to be released. Let's study this operation more closely. The upper end of the rod transmits the movement to a half-moon shaped device called the escapement. The two ends of the escapement are called lugs. Penetrating the magazine, they control the release of the mattresses. The mat in the first row is held up solely by the front lug of the escapement. As the key rod lifts, the front lug of the escapement lowers, releasing the first mat. At the same time, the rear lug is lifted and holds the second matrix. As the key rod lowers, the spring returns the escapement to a position of rest, thus allowing the second mat to move forward in the place of the one released an instant before. The same operations are repeated at every touch of a key. The mats that we see come out are arranged in the magazine situated at the upper part of the machine. It rests in a slanted position to facilitate the descent of the mat. It is substantially formed by two trapezoidal plates, one below and one above, which, as in our case, can be made of visalite. On the inside of the magazine there are grooves called channels, which support and guide the circulating mattresses. The magazine has 90 channels, 
corresponding to the 90 keys on the keyboard. Every channel contains a maximum of 21 circulating mats, which are sufficient for the normal requirements of composition. Generally, a mat carries two letters, Roman and Italic, or Roman and Bold. A magazine contains lowercase letters, Roman and Italic, controlled by the left section of the keyboard. The uppercase letters, Roman and Italic, controlled by the right section. The small caps, numbers and punctuation marks controlled by the middle section of the keyboard. In changing to another type, larger or smaller, the magazine must be changed. Similarly, in going to another series or letter design. It is precisely for this reason that machines are built with a capacity of up to four movable magazines, any of which can be replaced with others. The pre-selected magazine is brought into working position with the escapements aligned over the key rods. The mats released from the magazines are now directed toward the assembling elevator. Now we'll see the whole operation in slow motion. They are guided in their descent by the assembler entrance partitions, which prevent them from turning out of correct position. The mats fall upon a delivery belt in constant motion, which carries them in correct sequence to the assembling elevator. It takes the same length of time for all mattresses to reach the assembling elevator due to the design of the assembler entrance and matrix delivery belt. Before reaching the assembling elevator, the mats have to pass under a small spring blade called a shoot plate, which cuts down its speed so that the rotating star wheel can turn it upright and move it forward against the others in the assembling elevator. At the left, the mats are held upright by a wedge or a finger attached to a long horizontal bar called a slide, which travels to the left as fast as the mats arrive. The assembling elevator consists of a front and a back plate. When fastened together, they form a channel in which the mats can assemble. These moving levers control the duplex rail. With this device, the mats can assume two positions in the assembling elevator. Mats in the first position, Roman, rest on the fixed lower rail. Mats in the second position, italic or boldface, rest on the movable duplex rail. Hence, each mat can present independently to the mold opening either one of the two characters. Here is a line of mattresses which illustrates this principle. For a greater convenience, the upper part of the assembling elevator is equipped with a hinged gate. A steel wedge known as a space band is assembled between one word and the next. The space bands are released by the key situated at the left of the keyboard. Because of their dimensions, the space bands cannot fit into the matrix magazine. Therefore, they are stored in a box above the assembling elevator. The parts for releasing the space band are similar to those which release the mattresses from the magazine. The space band consists of two parts, the tail, a slide, and the small head. Both are wedge-shaped. 
They are held together by a dovetail construction. The small head is held stationary by the lugs in the grooves of the first elevator, so it remains fixed when the corresponding slide rises. In that manner, the expansion of the space band is obtained. Whatever the position of the slide, the outside surfaces of the slide and head are always parallel due to the construction of the part. The function of the space bands is to expand or spread out the line to the predetermined length, thereby increasing the space between words evenly. This is called justification. Having completed the line and checked that the number of space bands is sufficient for the amount of expansion needed, the operator can send it to be cast. The transfer is carried out by the delivery slide constantly held under tension by a spring and held in place by a small lever which will be released by the raised assembling elevator. The delivery slide consists of a short fixed finger and a long moving one. They receive the line and carry it through the transfer channel to the first elevator. At this point, we end the operations of the first group and take up the second, the casting. Clothing values are high And the prices are low no. That's why at Robert Hall Robert. You save on family clothes no. You're watching Sleepcore, media for insomnia better teeth. Number one on the list of things which help us teeth is the right kind of food. If we teeth are going to be strong, we must have lime or calcium. This is found in milk, leafy green vegetables, and milk products. makes us thrive is phosphorus. You will find it abundantly in milk, eggs, beans, prunes, cereals, and meat. Carnivore oil, cod liver oil, and viosterol are rich in vitamin D, which is good for the bones as well as the teeth. Healthy gums also need certain foods. Oranges, lemons, tomatoes, cabbage, and pineapples are rich in vitamin C. Now we come to health number two, and that is exercise. Health number three is your toothbrush. In buying a toothbrush, be sure to get one which is small enough. will be glad to tell you the right kind to buy. Your 
toothbrush will last longer if, before using it, you let it stand for about two hours in a solution of one teaspoonful of salt in a glass of water. If the whole family's toothbrushes are kept together like this, it makes it easy for germs to pass from one brush to the other. This is the right way to keep your toothbrush. The right kind of a toothbrush hanging in its proper place where the sun can dry it is a very fine sight indeed. But it won't do us teeth any good unless it is used regularly in the proper manner. Downward on the upper teeth, count to 10. Upward on the lower teeth, 10 strokes again. Remember the inside surfaces of your teeth as well. And finally, the grinding or biting surfaces. Take your time about it. You are not through until every surface of every tooth has been brushed carefully. Form the habit of brushing your teeth carefully at least twice a day, in the morning and at night. You couldn't put your time to better use. You're watching Sleep Core. Sleep tight. Electronics is a science that applies these tubes to the service of man, to the speeding of production, to the winning of the war. To understand how electronic tubes work, let's take a good look at one of them, one that's representative of its species. This is a diode, a typical two-element electronic tube. Let's get inside it. In fundamental operation, it resembles an ordinary single-pole switch, a switch that can connect, for instance, this battery and its motor load. One power lead comes to the anode, the other lead goes to the cathode. When this switch is open, the contacts are insulated from each other by a vacuum or by some inert gas inserted into an evacuated tube under low pressure. To close this switch electronically, all we need to do is heat the cathode and give the anode a positive potential. Then here's what happens. As electrons are emitted from the surface of the heated cathode, being negatively charged, they fly at tremendous speed to the anode. In this way, a current carrying path is formed, which closes our electronic switch and permits our motor to operate. You'll notice, by the way, that the direction of electron flow is contrary to the orthodox concept of current flow from plus to minus. Now, at this point, you may ask, if an electronic tube is basically just a form of switch, why is electronics hailed today as the technique of a new engineering era? 
To answer that question, let's review six of the basic things that we can do with this new kind of switch. In the first place, we can rectify current with it, converting AC to DC. We can do this merely by connecting an electronic tube in series with an AC circuit. As you study this circuit diagram, note that only each positive half wave of AC voltage will now produce a current. When the anode is negative, the electrons are repelled and no current flows. In other words, because only the cathode can emit electrons, we have here what amounts to a one-way street. We can visualize the result of the tube's rectifying action with the aid of these two oscilloscopes. The one on the left shows alternating current coming in. The one on the right shows pulsating direct current going out. The applications of this basic rectifying principle are many and important. Here's one of them, changing AC to DC on the nation's electrified transportation system. Here's another, rectification for electroplating operations of all kinds, operations possible only with direct current. Still another example, furnishing DC in steel mills for the driving of variable speed motors, such as the one controlling this giant ladle or the ones driving steel conveyors with such precise control of speeds that danger of buckling and tearing and consequent mill damage is eliminated. Electronic rectification is also helping to build American air power by making available record-breaking quantities of aluminum for plane construction. From Arkansas mud to American air power involves a complicated conversion of material. Before pure aluminum can be extracted from this bauxite ore, Direct current must be applied in a vital reduction process. To obtain that direct current from AC transmission lines, the Ignitron rectifier is used. This Westinghouse electronic development changes vast quantities of AC to DC with higher efficiency than any similar type of conversion equipment. Today, it's the main source of current supply for the nation's great aluminum industry, an industry that has achieved a miraculous expansion to meet the demands of a world at war. Magnesium from seawater is another achievement of industry under the stress of war. Ignitrons used in the extraction process speed up the delivering of incendiary and demolition bombs to the centers of Axis production. Still another example of electronic rectification at work is the precipitron, a device for cleaning air electrostatically. This diagram explains how the precipitron works. The rectifying property of electronic tubes is used to apply a potential of 13,000 volts DC to tungsten wires and 6,500 volts DC to collector plates. As incoming air passes through the field of these wires, each particle of dirt receives a positive electrostatic charge. When the positively charged particle reaches the collector chamber, it's attracted to and deposited on negative plates. In this way, air is cleaned so thoroughly that dirt particles down to a quarter millionth of an inch are removed. This is a vital advantage today, not only in homes and public buildings, but in industrial plants of all kinds. For instance, in plants manufacturing delicate instruments where air cleanliness is necessary for precision work in workrooms where optical systems are assembled for a host of military purposes, in inspection rooms where minute parts must be closely examined under high magnification. Air cleanliness is vital too in film developing rooms like this one. To understand how electronic air cleaning helps here, let's go aloft in a reconnaissance plane. Click. 5,000 feet above the earth, a camera shutter opens and closes. Scores of square miles of enemy territory have been squeezed down into an image on a photographic plate, an image measured in inches instead of miles. On this photograph, a city might be covered by a tip of a finger. A speck of dust could hide a Nazi aerodrome. The rectifying tubes of the precipitron help make sure that dust doesn't sabotage military photography. Now, so far in this film, we've discussed only one of the basic things we can do with the electronic tube. 
we can use it to rectify. The second basic thing we can do with it is amplify. Here's how. Between the cathode and the anode of the two-element tube, which we diagrammed a while ago, we now place a grid. To this grid, we connect an input of some weak voltage which we wish to amplify, perhaps that of a faint radio signal from halfway around the world. Now let's see what happens. Every time a negative potential is impressed on the grid, even though it be very minute, it has a large effect in reducing the number of the negatively charged electrons which would otherwise keep flying from cathode to anode. Conversely, when the grid is positive, an equally large effect is exerted in increasing the flow of electrons from cathode to anode. The important thing to note here is this. A small amount of power applied at the grid is amplified into a large amount of power in the anode or work circuit. This amplifying property of the three-element electronic tube is put to work in innumerable ways. Westinghouse electronic amplification now helps provide radio and radio telephone contact between airplanes and control stations on the ground, between ships and their communication bases both afloat and ashore, between individual tanks and their tank force commanders, between firing line and headquarters, between seadrome lights and night flying pilots who can turn them on by radio signal. In the field of power engineering, electronic amplification permits the measurement and analysis of minute voltages, stepping them up to the point where they can be seen and interpreted on oscilloscopes. When this giant rotor is completed, its precise dynamic balancing will be made possible by amplifying tubes. Testing of these propellers for vibration fatigue will also be facilitated by electronic amplifying tubes. Up to now, we've considered two of the basic things that the electronic tube can do. It can rectify, it can amplify. A third thing it can do is generate. The term generate in this connection is meant in a general rather than a technical sense. A triode is connected for oscillation in the way shown here. The system then becomes capable of changing direct current into alternating current. Note that what we're doing in this case is amplifying in the usual way and then feeding back to the grid part of the amplified voltage. Continued repetition of this feedback results cumulatively in a strong alternating current. This electronic means of generating alternating current is important because it can produce very high frequencies, frequencies up to millions of cycles, far beyond the range of ordinary rotating equipment. A familiar application of this is the radio transmitter. This modern transmitting room of Westinghouse Station KDKA is a far cry from the pioneering equipment of its famous predecessor. This scene reproduces an historic occasion, the first time a radio transmitter was used for large-scale public entertainment. This is Station KDKA of the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company. We are about to begin the reading of the presidential election returns between Warren G. Harding and James M. Cox. Stand by, please. Here is a new, less familiar application of electronic high-frequency generation. High-frequency heating of 200,000 cycles per second is now used to flow tin as the final step in the electrolytic plating of steel strip. After steel strip comes from its electrolytic tin plating bath, it first passes through a washer, then between hot air drying jets. At this point, the steel strip has a coating of tin that is relatively dull and porous. Next comes a vital step. The strip is raised to the top of the heater unit housing, inside of which is a series of high-frequency coils. As the strip comes down through these coils, induced electric current causes heat, which flows the tin almost instantaneously, greatly improving its structure as a protective covering. Here's the result. Tin plate that is mirror smooth, free from porosity, so perfect a protective covering that one pound of tin can now do the work of three. Note the horizontal bars in this close-up. These are parts of one of the high-frequency coils that affect the tin flow. If you look closely, you can see the difference in texture between the porous tin entering the top of the coil and the shiny flowed tin leaving at its base. And these are the tubes that generate the high-frequency current which makes the entire process possible. Another important result of this new Westinghouse electronic process is time saving. 
Tin can now be flowed at a rate of more than a thousand feet a minute. Here's another example of where electronic high frequency generation is doing a job today. Dielectric bonding of plastic and plywood sections in a matter of minutes instead of days. As a result of this application, plywood constructed PT boats can be produced more speedily. Dielectric heating also cures intricate plastic forms faster and better. Here a dielectrically cured plastic piece is being given a stress analysis. Carrier current relaying also applies the electronic principle of high frequency generation. Here's part of the equipment that does the work. This equipment makes possible an enormous increase in the speed with which transmission lines can be cleared of faults. Its effect is to increase the load carrying ability of a system up to 50% or more. We've now illustrated three of the basic ways that the electronic tube can be put to work. It rectifies, it amplifies, it generates. And here's a fourth thing it does. It controls. This diagram illustrates one of the principal mechanisms of electronic control. We use the grid here not to amplify a weak signal, but to control the flow of power to a machine. To do this, we connect the control circuit in such a way that it becomes a function of temperature, speed, time, or any other variable. As a result, grid potential is varied, and the work circuit is automatically closed, modified, or open. And we can do all this with split-second timing and incomparable precision. Take, for instance, this electronically controlled spot welder. Without sound, without friction, Without flame, electronic control on this equipment makes and breaks contact with split-second timing. Seam welding, too, is electronically controlled. As a result, plane parts today are being literally sewn together with electric current as thread. But welding, of course, represents only one opportunity for electronic control. Automatic stepless regulation of motor speeds is another application. Without the smooth acceleration which such control makes possible, delicate materials, such as the capacitor windings being handled here, might be broken under the shock of starting and abrupt speed changes. Now for still another basic thing that the electronic tube can do. It can also serve as a bridge to transform light into electric current. Here's how. We replace the ordinary heat-activated cathode of a two-element electronic tube with one made of photosensitive material. Light can now replace heat as the stimulator of electronic emission. The stronger the light, the greater the electronic emission, and consequently, with the aid of an amplifier, the more power flowing through the work circuit. This is important because it means that photoelectric tubes can function as light relays and so be given an almost infinite variety of jobs to do. Scanning the soundtrack of the talking motion picture film you're listening to right now is one of them. Another is the television camera. The iconoscope used in this camera is merely a special form of electronic tube. Product and process control is still another application. In this plant, a photo troller automatically stops a conveyor belt every time a lightning arrestor comes to its point of inspection. Here, a Westinghouse electronic eye inside the metal housing spots pinholes in metal strip as it comes from the rolls, automatically operating a relay that rejects defective sections, dropping them out of the production line without a moment's loss of working time. One of the most important basic things that the electronic tube can do remains yet to be listed. Besides transforming light into electric current, it can also transform electric current into light. The cathode ray tube is an application of this property. Through the aid of this tube, an electron beam is able to recreate an original image on the screen of a television receiving set. The electronic X-ray tube indirectly also transforms electric current into light, and by its effect on photographic plate, into light images. Here's how an X-ray tube works. A high potential ranging up to 300,000 volts or more is applied between the anode and cathode. Electrons are emitted by a focusing cathode. 
Due to the extremely high voltage, the electrons hit the anode with tremendous impact and cause the emission of waves of exceptionally high frequency. These high frequency waves do three useful things. Penetrate, excite fluorescence, or affect photographic plate. As a result, doctors can now study human internal organs by means of the fluoroscope. Or by means of radiography, they can photograph them. Industrial X-ray today is also playing a vital role, detecting porosities and fissures in welded metal seams, examining heavy castings for invisible internal weaknesses. But X-ray isn't the only example of electronic usefulness in the conversion of current into light. The whole field of modern fluorescent lighting represents another application. So does the field of ultraviolet radiation. Harmless-looking tubes like this one have a deadly effect on bacteria and other forms of microscopic life. In this demonstration, parmesia rather than bacteria are about to be subjected to sterile lamp rays. Notice what happens. The sterile lamp today is becoming increasingly important, both as a servant of public health and as a device for the preservation of perishable goods. So many and so varied are the applications of electronics that a single film like this can mention only one in a thousand. We haven't even mentioned, for instance, radar, the electronic development that helped save Britain during the decisive weeks of the German aerial blitz. Here's what happened. Ultra-high frequency waves were broadcast into the skies from English defense stations. When enemy planes approached in the darkness or in the fog, these waves would reflect back to the transmitting point thus giving warning to the defenders of Britain, permitting anti-aircraft batteries to swing into action and RAF planes to rise for combat. Whenever Hitler's bombers attack, at whatever altitude, from whatever direction, British interceptors were waiting for them. As a result, the Luftwaffe was blasted from the English skies and the tide of war turned. electronic tube, in essence, is only a switch. But what a switch! It rectifies, amplifies, generates, controls, transforms light into electricity and back into light again. These tubes that look so mysterious are essentially simple in operation, incredibly rugged and sure in application. They open and close all forms of electronic circuits as swiftly as the lightning flash and as silently as the passage of time. In the world of today, they're helping us to win a war. In the world of tomorrow, they bid fair to lift all of us to new levels of achievement, comfort, and security.